Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. After you have completed today's dissection of completely reflecting the skin over to the lateral aspect of the body, we get down for a study of the subcutaneous connective tissue. The subcutaneous connective tissue is in general loose connective tissue with fat embedded in it. There's a variable amount of fat in the body and from specimen to specimen. When you look at uh, some of the skin that we have dissected, you can see along here uh, some of the fat still adhering to the skin in the various areas but here we are truly right down to that pig skin layer. So that whenever you're dissecting and reflecting the skin and you have this problem of seeing too much fat on the skin surface, get back to that pig skin appearance of the undersurface of the skin. In addition to that, we see a variable amount of fat throughout the body. Here, for example, in the shoulder area on this specimen, there's quite a bit. It's uh, much thinner down in the uh, midline of the back region. And over here on the uh, buttock region, we could see an area where the dissection has gone too deep. You could see uh, by looking closely at it that we have muscle fibers showing through the fat. Here is where the dissector went too deep in reflecting the skin. So that in this general area and only this small area, it's not too bad. It's nothing to worry about. However, if that had continued throughout the entire procedure, we wouldn't have any of the subcutaneous structures to study. What you want to do now is to make, again, a midline incision along the spines of the vertebrae in order to cut through the subcutaneous connective tissue. And this tissue is very dense and very adherent to the underlying structures. It is in this subcutaneous connective tissue throughout, coming from the midline over to the side of the body, that the small arteries, veins, and nerves that supply the skin will be passing in this fat. And so this fat must be dissected in order to see these underlying structures. Here, for example, I have opened an area along the midline. And you can see that this material, just by using the probe on, is very, very dense. It's very difficult to reflect. If you use a scalpel blade, you'll be cutting all of these uh, small arteries and veins. But here, for example, is one of these structures, a nerve with its artery passing out from near the midline and going into the subcutaneous connective tissue, passing laterally to supply the skin over the scapular area. Now, we only can see a little bit of it at this time, and you should begin cleaning this up so that the nerve can be exposed in a greater distance. But again, notice the toughness of this material. And so what you want to do is very carefully and meticulously cut through the fat Go back to the probe, dissect it out a little bit further. And you see there's little tunnels, as it were, in this connective tissue that the nerves and arteries will run. These should be open, but don't cut too deep, else you will injure the neurovascular structure. And keep this up. so that you can find the nerve going all the way out to its area of supply. Again, if you get the probe underneath this, sometimes the material will pull away so that you can follow the nerve. Other times you have to refer back and use your scalpel. And here you see the nerve now passing from near the midline laterally to go into the 
skin of the back over the scapular region. All these branches can be continued out further until literally they start to break because of their minuteness. After you have seen several sets of these, and of course this work will be done on both sides of the body, both right and left sides, that uh, you will then start to reflect the subcutaneous connective tissue so that we can get down onto uh, the deep back muscles, uh, the trapezius latissimus dorsi. Now when we look at the body again, an overview, we want to make sure that we stay on the midline for this preliminary incision. So far I have stayed on the vertebral spines here down into the lumbar region and always palpate first rather than cutting. We know that this is scapular, some spinous processes can be felt here. This back is slightly curved, so we have to take it over something like this. But follow the vertebrae rather than getting off of the midline. And then in your dissection work, begin to reflect the subcutaneous connective tissue after you have seen the cutaneous nerves. And here you have to be very careful because directly beneath this material, we have a broad aponeurosis for the area of attachment of the latissimus dorsi muscle. Again, using the broad flat surface of the knife rather than the, just the very tip portion. And sometimes it's useful to get underneath the material that you're dissecting, if it's loose enough, with the handle of the scalpel blade rather than only the sharp portion. This material needs to be reflected and it will be removed and thrown away. Whereas the skin we will save as a protective wrapping for the body in order that it does not dry out excessively. We're getting into a stage of dissection work now that requires fairly meticulous cleanup because when we want to study these various muscles and aponeuroses, you cannot have the fat still adhering to it. For example, here we're getting down now to the aponeurosis of the latissimus dorsi. And you can see these connective tissue fibers in through this area. Here, however, I have not yet removed enough of the fat. And all you do is see fat in this region, and you cannot follow out the fiber direction. So all of this should continue to be removed and extended as far laterally as the uh, skin flaps were reflected. Now, it's at about this time, and I'm noticing it already with this scalpel blade, but this blade is extremely dull because skinning uh, takes the edge off of the blade very, very quickly, whereas other dissections, the blade might last for uh, three or four or five dissections. And so that at about this time in your dissection work, you should think about changing your scalpel blade so that you can work faster and get the work completed uh, eas more easily than before. Here, now we're starting to get into some muscle layering. And you see this connective tissue, the subcutaneous connective tissue, should be removed from the muscle as you're doing your dissection. All of the partners will be again dissecting today. And notice you want to move fairly smoothly and not get too deep underneath these muscles, lest you have a problem in reflecting the muscle along with the subcutaneous connective tissue, and then you won't have anything to study, and your work will be more difficult in the laboratory. We're starting to get down to muscle. This is how you want to clean off your, your tissue. Here is still some fat adherent onto the subcutaneous connective tissue uh, un from the underside of the material that we're trying to reflect. But today is basically a cleanup type of dissection. 
Now, if you get too deep, you are going to get directly through this very, very thin aponeurosis. And as you notice, I can bulge it up. It is, I'll purposely cut into it just to show you that it is as thin as a piece of paper. So don't get too deep and reflect that uh, with the subcutaneous connective tissue. And continue this kind of dissection throughout the entire back region uh, so that we can uh, proceed with the study of the large muscle masses of the back. Now that the subcutaneous connective tissue has been removed from the muscles overlying the entire back area, you can start to see the different fiber directions of individual muscles. Here, for example, latissimus dorsi, trapezius up uh, higher towards the neck area. But still, when we look down upon these uh, individual muscles, you can see that the muscle fibers just do not show up well yet because they are covered by some connective tissue, the epimesium of the muscle. This is an outer wrapping. It is not the subcutaneous connective tissue, but it is the outer wrapping of the muscle itself. And every muscle of the body has this kind of a connective tissue covering. In order for us to be able to see detailed muscle fibers throughout the extent of the entire latissimus dorsi here, or trapezius and shoulder muscles up higher, we must remove this epimesium. Now, the way to do it, and again, when we look closely towards the muscle fibers themselves, you can see that in this area, we are starting to be able to relate the direction of the muscle fibers passing from the midline over and around the side of the body. But for clarification of these, we really have to get in here underneath this epimesial layer and remove it from the muscle so that you're exposing the muscle fibers themselves. This is a very tedious and time-consuming procedure. All of you should be working on the specimen at this time in order to expedite this removal. And once this material is removed through the entire extent of the muscle, then first can you really begin to study the attachments of latissimus dorsi trapezius, the deltoid muscle of the shoulder, as well as the infraspinatus and the teres major coming off of the scapula. Again, make sure that your blade is sharp because this kind of work uh, goes extremely slow if you do not have a sharp blade in your scalpel handle. And if you get into some of the muscle fibers by cutting a bit too deeply, just back off and get back into the proper plane. But as I'm doing this again now, in a, a view from overhead, you can see with clarity how these muscle fibers are being exposed. Here is more material that has to be removed. But in this view, you can see muscle fibers starting to appear and over in this direction, this area, fibers running towards the shoulder from the low back region. So all these muscles then should be clarified by removing the epimesia before studying. But this is the uh, end of the uh, dissection once this material is removed for your study. At this time, you should be studying the three bones to which the muscles attach that we have been looking at in this dissection. One of the first bones that should be looked at because it is in the posterior area for muscle attachment is the scapula. We've talked about this briefly before, the triangular shaped bone. Looking at it here in relationship to the ribs, you will see that it is a relatively flat bone and that this uh, very prominent angle is pointing downward, this the inferior angle that we spoke of before, and the vertebral border running along the side of the vertebrae. In addition to that, from the posterior aspect, you can very obviously see the spine of the scapula going out to its flattened end, the acromial process. Articulating with the scapula are two other bones. 
in the front of the collarbone, or more properly called the clavicle, and also the humerus, which is the main and only bone of the arm down as far as the elbow. These are the three bones then that should be studied in detail. And now let's look at the scapula to see its detailed morphology. When we look at the individual scapula now, we see again its very obvious triangular shape with the vertebral border running medially along the bodies of the vertebrae. The axillary border that abuts against the axilla, which is the armpit, and the superior border, which is very irregular in comparison to the other two. The superior angle is the mate to the one that we've discussed before, and that is the inferior angle down below. Laterally, we truly don't have an angle, but it is a broad fossa for the articulation of the humerus, and this is called the glenoid fossa. The back of the scapula is divided into two portions, one below and one above the spine, by the spinous process that extends laterally to its broadened area, the acromial process. This acromion articulates with the clavicle in front, and it is at this junction between the two bones that most frequently you will, most frequently you will find the uh, a football type of shoulder separation. Because this posterior area is divided into two regions, these regions have names in relation to the spine itself. Below we have the infraspinous fossa, a broad, shallow depression, and above the supraspinous fossa. Both of these are for the attachment of specific muscles, muscles which, by the way, have the same names as the fossa to which they attach. Above, we can see, along the superior border, the scapular notch, through which uh, certain structures pass that we will be dissecting in the future. When this bone is turned over, you will see that on the underside of the scapula, on the costal surface, that it is one broad, flat, shallow depression. This whole area is called the subscapular fossa. Better seen in this illustration is the articulation for the humerus, the upper end of the humerus. And from this front end area, we see a bent finger-like process of bone, the coracoid process, to which many of the uh, muscles of the arm as well as the front of the chest will be attaching. And behind it is, again, the broad, flat, acromial end of the scapula. Now let's go back to the skeleton once more and look at the relationship of the scapula, which we see posteriorly. Notice the humerus, the arm bone, uh, articulating in the glenoid fossa and extending anteriorly into the front of the upper portion of the chest is the clavicle. Now, we want to look at both clavicle and humerus, and let us take the clavicle first and study its anatomy. The details of the clavicle are really minimal in comparison to the numerous bony markings that we had on the scapula. The clavicle has a rounded end, and this end abuts with the breastbone, the sternum. It is relatively round throughout a good portion of its course until, again, we come over to the lateral aspect where we see a broad, flattened extremity, just as we saw the spine of the scapula spreading out. This is the acromial end of the clavicle, the mid portion is called the shaft of the clavicle, and most medially, closest to the center line of the body, is the sternal end of the clavicle. As we look down on this clavicle, it is one from the left side of the body, you notice that there is a double curvature to it. 
The medial one half closest to the midline of the body is bowed forward, and then the lateral half is bowed rearward. This is how you can easily identify by using these four landmarks of the rounded sternal end, the flattened acromial end, and these two curvatures to identify whether you have a right or a left clavicle. There are a few roughened areas on the undersurface of the clavicle for the attachment of specific ligaments. Here, on the undersurface of the rounded portion, is a roughened tuberosity area that uh, attaches or has attaching to it uh, the supporting ligament of the sternoclavicular joint. Whereas when we look out laterally, we will see a very heavy roughened area where ligaments extend from the coracoid process of the scapula to this undersurface lateral portion of the clavicle. In addition to the clavicle, then, we should study the upper end of the humerus. And as you see, the upper end of the humerus is ball-like. This is a true ball and socket joint of the body. And as we approach the details of it, we do see the rounded head that uh, fits into the glenoid fossa. And laterally on the bone are two roughened elevations, a large one more laterally called the greater tubercle, and then more forward but smaller in size, the lesser tubercle. And between the two is a depression the intertubercular groove. Now, these bony markings vary in size and in ruggedness, depending whether it is a male or a female specimen. In addition, we see extending downward from this greater tubercle a crest of bone that is at the edge of this intertubercular groove. And so this is called the crest of the greater tubercle whereas the crest of the lesser tubercle is only obvious here, and it soon fades out. These landmarks, lesser tubercle, greater tubercle, intertubercular groove, and the crest of the greater and lesser tubercles uh, need to be known because our muscles that we will be studying, not only in today's dissection, but in future dissections, articulate at this point. One other basic landmark that should be noted, and that is about halfway down on the shaft of the humerus, we will see a bulging area off on the lateral aspect, and this is where the deltoid muscle attaches. Here you can see the roughness of the bone, and it is called the deltoid tubercle. Tubercle means a roughened area on the bone, and it's called deltoid because the deltoid muscle inserts into it. This is the kind of detail, then, that we should be studying on each and every one of the bones of the body so that you will have a familiarity with them. Not only should you study the bones as they're articulated at the skeleton, but also the individual bone specimens as well. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.